It's nice to be with you and uh, to be at your gathering here uh, this evening. I have been praying during the week uh, regarding what to speak on, and the Lord has kept leading me in one particular direction. So I'm going to do just what he said, and we're going to turn, if you have a Bible, we're going to turn to Psalm 66, Psalm 66. And we're going to read from the verse 16, Psalm 66 and the verse 16. And the psalmist said, Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his inerrant word. Let's bow together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for an open Bible. We thank you for all who have gathered. And Lord, we especially thank you, Lord, for your presence, which we know will deepen and continue. And we know, Lord, that you will come and you will put your hand upon people's lives and you will really speak to them. And Lord, I pray that people will be wed or married to the will of God in this gathering tonight. I pray that there will be those who will abandon all the ambitions they have in life and they'll choose to follow Jesus. I pray that their tremendous transactions will take place in hearts. I take authority in your name, Lord, over every demonic influence in the heavens that is seeking to, Lord, interfere, to, Lord, aggravate and stop uh, what you're doing. And we take authority over that now in the heavens in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you will increase the fire around this property. You said in your word, Lord, to Israel, I will be a fire around about you and the glory in the midst. And so we pray that you will increase the fire and that the glory will come in the midst. I give myself to you, Lord. I pray that you will cleanse and sanctify me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me, Lord, please, to speak the words that will greatly honor and glorify and magnify our Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it, giving thanks in his name. Amen and amen. Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. During the week, if you haven't already sensed what I'm going to do is I've done it before many times, but I really felt the Lord impressing on me. I want you to share what, what I've done for you and how I've saved you and the things I've done in your life. So trusting in the Lord and hoping to say the things he wants me to say and to leave out the things that need to be left out, I trust that God will help me to share a word of testimony and God's grace in my life. I come to thank God tonight, and I come to thank him before this congregation and before the host of heaven and before any demonic presence that is outside the fire of God tonight, I come to declare what the Lord hath done for my soul. We have a wonderful Savior, and I'm so glad that I have met Jesus. I'm so glad that he's my Savior and my Lord, and I'm so glad that someday, when earth is past, that I will be with him in heaven, and I will enjoy that wonderful city and country and that new world called heaven. I was brought up not many miles from here, between the two villages of Moy and Van Berg, in a farm where I was the youngest of eight children. And I was brought up in a very happy home, and I had very good parents. And over the years, as I have in recent years ministered a lot to people in my home, there's virtually hardly a day goes by that there isn't at least one person comes to my home for prayer or for some need. 
I've come to realize how blessed I was as a child, although we didn't have loads of money. <laughs> and we didn't have everything we wanted. One thing I did have was a loving mother and father. And I've come to appreciate that as I've got older, to recognize that my mom and dad never hurt me. They never abused me. They never criticized me. They didn't put me down. My mom and dad loved me. And that is one of the most wonderful blessings can be put into the life of a child, to be loved. And to be told that you're loved and that you're accepted. And yet there are so many today, and I'm sure there are probably some in this congregation, and you can't say that that was your life, that mom and dad maybe didn't love the way they could or should, or maybe couldn't because of the issues that had happened in their lives. But being in a family of eight children, we didn't all get our way, and everybody had to do their part. But being the youngest, all my siblings would still say that I was the spoiled one, and possibly that was true. Happy childhood, but at the age of seven turning eight, one night very suddenly, my father died. He was just turning 50 years of age, and it was completely out of the blue. And as a little child, I remember very vividly all that happened at that time. I can remember my mother coming back into the living room after she had been to the bedroom. I didn't go where my dad had died. I was afraid to go up because I could hear all the crying and what was going on, and I just was afraid to go up. And I can remember my mother coming back down an hour or so later and seeing the sadness and the terrible grief in her heart as a little boy. And I knew that something terrible had happened in our home that night, and I knew that things would never be the same. But I had a good mother, and although she had eight children to rear and a farm to run, she kept to it and she uh, tried her best. But one of the great blessings that we had growing up was that although we went to a local church where at that time the gospel wasn't preached, yet my mother had become a Christian when she was quite young through the ministry of the Faith Mission. And despite the fact that she had somewhat slipped a little in her devotion to the Lord, yet she knew that her children would need to be saved. And so she always told me about God. And I can have still recollections. I'm sure those of us who are older, when we get older, we think a little bit more about little events that happened when we were children. They seem to come back stronger as you get older. And I can still remember little things like watching her with flowers, and she used to say, only God could do that. I remember sitting at her knee, and she started to tell me about what heaven was like and what the Bible had to say as a little boy. And those kind of things were just embedded into me but the rough and tumble of life went on. It wasn't perfect. There was a lot of shouting and sometimes fighting among the siblings. If you've had eight, you'll know what it's like. And we were no different. But there was that awareness of the gospel and the need for us to receive the gospel. Just before my father had died, my oldest brother had become a Christian. And although he had become a Christian, I didn't really know a lot about that. But then at the opening of the... Um, I think it was the Armagh Free Presbyterian Church one night, a few years later, um, Ian Paisley then was preaching. And I remember it was very different for I was Presbyterian, and so when, when the meeting was over, we all ran out and got into our cars and probably laughed at other people and what, how they dressed and something that happened to them or whatever, but that's what church was <clears throat> to us as children. But this was different because whenever the meeting was over, instead of the people walking out, all the people came forward. And it was my only recollection, actually, of, of a meeting where I recall an appeal for souls and where so many came forward. And when I turned around, the, my three sisters had gone, and they had all went forward to seek the Lord. Two of them are bright for the Lord today. There's one of them, I'm not too sure just really how she stands at present, but certainly two sisters are bright for the Lord. So God began to work in her heart. And then I had a brother, and he was as wild as a hare, broke my mother's heart. He took to drinking and, and, and just badly behaved. And he was the only black sheep, really, of the family. But I was very close to him. He was good to me. And uh, one day he came home when I was about 14, and he came home. 
and the news went round the house that Mervyn has got saved. And when he got saved, he really got saved because he went around all the neighbors. We had neighbors and he had fell out with them and he had fought with them and cut their heads just down. He had done everything he shouldn't do. He was a bad boy. But he went around all the neighbors and apologized to them and told them all that he had got saved and he had come to the Lord. And I saw such a change in my brother. It was so radical. And I remember going in. We weren't like, you know, modern houses now. If you've eight children, you've eight bedrooms. It wasn't like that. Me and him shared a room. And I can remember one day running into the bedroom. And I was just going in to get something. And I saw my brother on his knees with an open Bible on the bed. And I retreated out of that bedroom as quick as I could because I knew my brother was talking to God. And I knew whatever had happened to my brother, it was real and it was deep. And so God was moving in our home and God was saving members of the family. And my brother brought me a Bible and he, at that time he had just stopped weight training. He used to do a lot of weight training and he had muscles everywhere. He used to lie beside me, sleep beside me, and he would, beside I was only in my maybe, you know, mid, before mid-teens, about 13, 14, and he'd say to me, say, I'm going to read the Bible here. We, but I say, oh, I go ahead. I mean, you don't argue with somebody that has muscles that says, whatever you want to do, you do it. And he would read about maybe Revelation, about everybody, the wicked and so on, and they were all cast into the lake of fire, and if you're not saved, you went to the lake of fire, and then he'd pull the light and say good night. And he'd leave me dangling over hell somewhere over the lake of fire and away he'd go to sleep. But he witnessed to me and he tried to speak to me and undoubtedly prayed for me. Then a mission came when I was about 17 to Killyman and the late Reverend Sam Workman came. And that campaign was started and I didn't want to go. And the first week the tent was blown down and I really wasn't impressed. I went along the first night. Uh, being forced. You see, I was 17 now, and I was, although my family members were getting saved, I wanted to do my own thing. You know, we all want to do our own thing. We, we, we're all like that. The Bible says we have all turned to our own way, and it's the natural thing of man to do his own thing. You don't want God to be interrupting it. And I was like that. And so, the first night I went along to this mission, and I sat and they didn't, they didn't have the tent up, so that disappointed me. It was blown down. And then they decided they would take the parochial hall in, in Kiliman. And I was put into a little back room in 1982. And I went into this little back room, and I thought, oh, what a waste of a night. I'm sitting here, and I can just remember a teapot sitting in front of me. Where I just remember that. And I thought, with 20 people in the room, I thought, I'll not be back here. No way. There's nothing to see. There's a, it's just, I was just disgusted. And then the meeting started. I don't know what Mr. Workman said. I don't know if they sang or preached or prayed. I'm sure they've done all of that, but I recall none of it. But what I do recall was this, that something supernatural began to happen to me in that meeting. The only way I could describe it was that the truth of my condition before God moved from my head to my heart. I knew I was a sinner. I'd been told I was a sinner. I'd heard the gospel in the home. Pastors and preachers had come along to visit, and I knew these things, but suddenly it dropped about 18 inches, and it started in here. And for the first time in my life, I felt lost. I felt lost. And I felt that if I died the way I was, I would waken up in hell. And like one of old, I could begin to feel the flames of hell licking round my soul. I started to feel that. And I began to recognize that I was in danger. And that that danger was real because God had turned up by his spirit. And he was showing me that I wasn't right with him. And that my sin had separated between me and God. And that if I were to die in that state, there was no possibility of me ever being in heaven because it's a holy place. It is a sinless place. And nothing that defileth shall enter into it. And so I became so aware of my terrible condition and plight before God. I didn't need anybody to tell me to go back to the meetings. I said, when this tent goes up, I'll be back. And I wouldn't miss any of the meetings. I went night after night, and I thank God 
And I often did thank Mr. Workman. I met him on occasions, and I always, always went aside to say to him, thank you. Thank you for preaching the gospel. Thank you that you gave your life as a young man to follow the Lord because it was through your preaching that God spoke to my heart. And it was through you that I came to the kingdom. And I was so grateful. And you know, you should always be grateful for those that have paid a price in their past life to present the gospel to you. And I listened night after night and he faithfully preached. And he told us that we were sinners and he lifted the mirror of God's word. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He showed us that there's none righteous, no, not one. And with powerful illustrations, he presented the picture of lost sinners. And boy, was I in with that company. But then every night also, he told us about a savior. He told us about this person I had heard of before called Jesus. But he had really meant nothing to me much other than a good man. And he didn't really catch my affections. But suddenly, Jesus became so important to me. Because I realized he was my only hope. I realized that if I was to be in heaven, there was nothing of good works that could get me there. I had hoped up to then that perhaps the good things I had done would be of some avail to me. Maybe, maybe going to church, maybe helping people. I was hopeful perhaps that would help me. But you know, friends, the Bible says, by grace are you saved. It is through faith. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And every night he presented the truth of the gospel, that Jesus loved me. And that Jesus came and died for me, not only to forgive my sin, but to break the power of sin in my life. And to make me like Jesus. And as I heard that message, it so touched my heart, I remember thinking I would give an arm and a leg <laughs> to get what that man's talking for. I would give an arm and a leg. I was so afraid that what I would get would be false. I'd heard a little about false professions. People saying that they were Christians and they weren't Christians at all. Like a man one time in the open air with a friend, an old friend of mine, and he said to the friend of mine, he says, he says, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm saved. And when he walked away, the friend of mine turned around and said, the only thing that boy saved from is a cartwheel going over him. That's all he saved from. But I wanted to be really saved. And I was afraid that I would have some old false thing. Because you can get through life with an old false profession. People can believe you. But you know, Judas was in the company of the Lord's people. But Judas, when he died, the Bible says he went to his own place. He kissed the door of heaven, the Lord Jesus, and he went to hell. And you can be in the right company and you can be with the right people and still go to hell. And I was afraid of that. And the Bible says, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I wanted the Lord with all my heart. All my heart. And one night the evangelist, when he preached, he said, maybe you would like to put your hand up. Well, I would have loved to put hands and feet and everything up. But I was afraid. I didn't want to make a show of myself. I didn't want anybody to laugh at me. And the fear of man bringeth a snare. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of what they thought of me. And so many people sadly have gone to hell simply because they were afraid of their companions. But you know the hymn says, my old companion, fare ye well. I will not go with you to hell. I mean with Jesus Christ. To dwell. He said, maybe you can't put up your hand, but what you can do is you can bow your head and pray after me if you really mean it. And I thought, this is it. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. And I bowed my head and it was a little prayer, something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm really sorry for all my sin. I repent and I invite Jesus Christ to come into my life to Give me the power to be the person you want me to be. And, and I open the door. Please come in. And then he said, Lord Jesus, please help me now to tell others what you have done for me and to live the life that you want me to live. 
Amen. Well, the best way I could describe what happened would be in that tent in Kiliman almost 40 years ago would be heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, my night was turned to day, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When I went out of that tent, I could also have said the next day when I started over for college, heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green, something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen, birds with gladder songs or flow, flowers with deeper beauty shine, since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. I knew I was saved. I went into the tech the next day in Dungannon. I threw the door open and I said, I got saved last night. They looked at me. They didn't know what half of them had been from the Roman Catholic faith. Didn't know what was wrong. Just it must be another funny behavioral trait he has taken up. But I knew and I wasn't for holding back. Because the change was so real. The burden was gone, the sin was gone, the flames from my soul were gone, the assurance of heaven was there. There was nothing this world could offer me ever would have compensated or remotely come near what, for what Jesus did for me that night. He came to live inside me. And I have never been the same. I have never been the same. Have you failed? Absolutely. Have you had disappointments? Loads of them. But have you been the same? Never the same. Jesus came to live inside me. You know, friends, if Jesus comes to live inside you, you ought to be different. After all, he's God. And if you're going about saying God lives inside me, wouldn't it be strange if you weren't different? Wouldn't it be strange? So I started off on the journey of being a Christian. Now so many tell the story, and they come to the bit saved, and then they close their Bible, and everybody says, Amen. Well, that disappoints me because I believe that the story just starts there. It needs to be a story of you and Jesus, a story of your relationship with him and getting to know him. And so I started out and I went to a little church where the folk believed the gospel. I left the church I was in and some people have been ridiculed for that, for saying I left my church. But the best way to answer that is the words of the old, the old rough Irish evangelist W.P. Nicholson, and Nicholson, the great evangelist, said, you never put a living chick under a dead hen. And you know, friends, if you've got the life of Christ, don't sit in an old dead church. Yeah, because the wee chick will die. Yeah, a little chick needs life just like a little baby. They need life, they need heat, they need fed. And a dead hen can't do that. You need to have the life given. And so the Lord had wonderfully saved me and my brother that had influenced me so much, he was a great help to me. And so I started off in that little church and went to the prayer meeting. And I thank God that there's been a habit that I've kept all my life, and that is I've tried with the best of my ability every week of my Christian life, I've been at a prayer meeting. And I attribute many victories, in fact, if not most or all of them, to the fact that I've been to prayer meetings all my life. I really can't reconcile in my mind Christians who don't go to prayer meetings. It, it, I can't, I, I, it's one of the hurdles for my mind I can't get around. I can understand them not going to dead prayer meetings. The old dead prayer meeting and you're praying, I've been in them and I'm praying to God to get me out of them. That's all I pray, Lord, get somebody to stop this. Just please lift me out of this. I mean, I understand that. But you know, friend, if you've got a hunger for God, you can get other people that have a hunger for God and you can meet in your house and pray and call on God. But I can't understand why people don't pray. It just doesn't add up. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of supplication. He's the spirit of prayer. Yes, that's part of his job. And he wants us to pray. And he wants us to call on God. So I learned very early on to pray. And I opened my mouth wide in the prayer meeting. And I was shaking. I remember my ribs was, was going in and out the first time I ever prayed publicly. But I did it. For you can break the fear of man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And it can kill your spiritual life if you don't break out. You have to break free from whatever the enemy's holding over you. 
I remember getting up to preach in Armagh. I was only saved a couple of years, and they got me up to preach. I think I'd done about five minutes, and then I, I, I kind of headbutted the, the thing I was down. It was the liveliest brethren meeting I was ever in. They were jumping everywhere. Hmm. Now that particular meeting, like some of the rest of them were quiet. It was like the boy I heard about. <clears throat> I don't want to be cruel to my, my friends and the brethren for a family in them, and they're good folk. But it's a bit of a joke, but it's, you'll, get, you'll get the thought of it. This, this fellow was in the brethren, and he died in the meeting. So they called the, they called the ambulance. So they took 20 people out before they got him. <laughs> it was a bit like that. It was a bit like that. Anyway, I went along to, with those folk, and they were so good and kind to me. But after a few years, I realized there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong. I'm doing my reading and praying. I would have done a wee bit of gospel tracking. And, but there was just something absent. And you always see it, but there's something absent. And to cut the story short, I began to ask some of the folk in my assembly that loved the Lord. I used to, and they said, Alan, we're, the prayer meetings we go to, he says, it'll, that'll be no use for you. It's no use. You'll never, you'll never get what you're looking for. And I heard at that time there was a mission being held in Armagh and it was held by Norman Painter and a few others had arranged it in Armagh City in the Orange Hall. And he said, go you along, there's prayer meetings there and you go. He says, you'll get on well there. And I went along and met Bertie there and met a few others. But the prayer meetings were different to what I was used to because there was passion in them. There was real desire for God and and I knew in my heart that this was what I wanted. This is what I yearned for. Something that was real, that would live in me. And I began to pray. And I was praying in my heart, Lord, why am I not better? Why am I not? I'm told to win the lost and I don't. I'm told to pray and I don't. I'm told to, 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 to love you with all my heart and I don't. I mean, I knew everything that I needed to do. I'd been told and we all know that. But I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It went in one ear and out the other for years. And I got so tired of it. And I said, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of living like this. And if God doesn't intervene some way, I'm going to have to park this whole thing because I just feel I'm a sham. It's a good place to get when you're disgusted with yourself. I want to say to you that I'm a thorough, bred, 100%, perfect, absolute, total failure. I want to say that again, in case you've missed it. I'm a 100% total, thoroughbred, absolute, complete failure. Every area of my life, I'm a failure. There's not one area, and I have absolute compassion for people that come to my house every day, and their issues are sexual addictions, and, and to do with hurts and griefs, and whatever it might be. And I look at them, and I say, boy, if I was in your position, I'd probably be the same. Because you're only conveying to me what the Bible says, that without the power of the Holy Spirit, we're failures. No matter how religious we look, no matter what denomination we have, or doctrines we have screwed up in our wee heads, no matter what we have, if Christ does not rule and reign in every part of your heart, you're a failure. You're a failure. And God wants you to acknowledge it. And God wants you to see it. And God wants you to bring it to the throne and, and be honest with him. And so the Lord brought me to that place. And I said, Lord, I'm tired of this. And Lord, I'd love to know why I'm not going forward. And the Holy Spirit, one day in one of those prayer meetings where we were with, with Bertie and a few others, the late Cecil McMullen. And the Lord said to me in my heart, while I was just, I was just beginning to hear God. You know, it's lovely to begin to hear God. I meet people and they're 20 years saved. And they said, Alan, I've never heard God in my life. Heard sermons. <laughs> Heard preachers, I go to great churches, but I've never heard God. That's a tragedy, never to hear God. But as I began to seek him, God started to speak to me. And be, get, be ready for, if you really want God to speak to you, don't be expecting initially that it'll all be good news. Because I wasn't living the way that I wanted or that I should, or certainly not in alignment with the New Testament. And so I said, God, what's wrong? And I had been, at that stage, I was still in with my friends and the brethren folk who had been so good to me. And God said to me, Alan, you're an idolater. I said, Lord, 
there, there's communication problems there from heaven. That couldn't be right. I'm in the gospel hall. There's no way I could be an idolater. I could be many of the things, but that's certainly not one of them. For I have been baptized, and I break bread, and I sit around the Lord's table. And Lord, that's not possible. And the Holy Spirit so clearly showed me because I was very fond of cars at the time. Nothing wrong with a nice car, but I was too fond of it. And the Holy Spirit showed me that you get more joy out of washing and polishing your car than you do out of praying. And I thought, boy, that's true. I got a buzz out of looking after my car. But there was no buzz from the prayer, and I can tell you. And then the Lord said, and you get far more joy out of hoovering your car and polishing it inside than you do out of reading my word. And I thought, that's true. And God says, you haven't really grasped the commandment, thou shalt have no other gods in my sight. And the main cause of death in the church in Northern Ireland, in fact, right across the world, is not to do with morality. It's to do with idolatry. You see, sir, it could be your business. It could be your wife. It, lady, it could be your kitchen sink or your children. God says that thing that you love and enjoy above me, that is your God. And many Christians have multiple gods. And God says, I'm afraid I can't bless you while you have other gods. Those gods will have to go. And I never wept as a Christian over my sin. As, a, as an unsaved person over. But I can remember that the Holy Spirit so revealed to me the state of my heart as a Christian before God that I wept and wept over my sin as a Christian. Being in the gospel hall, doing all, doing, giving out tracts, I was doing all of it. But the Holy Spirit came and he said, Alan, you want to know the problem? I'm showing it to you. You can either receive it or you can turn away. And I said, Lord, I'll receive it. And I began to repent for idolatry as a Christian. The more I repented, the more the Holy Spirit began to show me things that had grieved him in my life. He began to show me the areas of my life where I was going to do God's work my way. My little plans of how I was going to work out the plan of God for me. Oh, I wasn't going to become a multimillionaire. I wasn't going necessarily the way of the world. But, but I wanted to do God's work my way. And I wanted perhaps a little bit of the glory. I wanted a little bit of the limelight. There were so many things that God showed me. And I began to repent. I began to repent. Then the Holy Spirit said to me, Alan, you've never given me all your life. You've never given me everything. You were very happy to give me your sin, but I don't want your sins. I don't collect them. They're no use to me in heaven. But I need you. I need you. I came to redeem you because I have an assignment for your life that was started in heaven whenever your human spirit was inserted into your mother's womb and whenever you were conceived of your mother and father. I planted you there. I knew you would come to me and I had a plan. And Alan, you must fall into line with that plan if you're going to please me. And to do that, you must yield your life unconditionally to Jesus Christ. You must give all your ambitions, dreams, everything you possess. You must unconditionally let go and let God become God. Let him become truly your father. Let him become the one who defends you and fights your corner. Let him be the one who comes and fills you with his love and his grace and begin to lean on him and learn of him. And I let go. I let go many years ago. And I gave Jesus a blank sheet of paper. And I signed it at the bottom and I said, Lord, you do and fill into that paper whatever you want. Whatever you want. I have no plans. I have no agenda. I have no spiritual ambitions. I have no dreams to be a great preacher or to be in a fellowship, to be a pastor. I have no ambitions in any way other than I want to do what God saved me to do. That's all I have. 
And I find it satisfies me to the core of my being because it pleases Jesus. And when it pleases Jesus, it brings a joy into my heart that my own ambitions could never, ever produce. And I let him be Lord, and I let go. And you know, it's one thing to let go, and that's the emptying of our lives. That's the emptying out of the vessel. It's abandoning all. But then, my friends, an empty vessel is no use unless it's filled. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I came to Jesus, and I said, Lord, I don't know what really I'm doing here, but I know you have told me to give all, and I know that you have a plan, and so I'm, I'm letting everything go, and Lord, I'm asking you now, please fill me with the Holy Spirit. Please give me your fullness, Lord, so that, so that I can live with your power and your enabling because I'm a complete failure. And friends, I'm not here to tell you of any great, grand experience or emphasize that. But what I am here to tell you is that a change, a wonderful and a heavenly and a holy change took place in my life. I'm here to tell you that where I found it hard to pray before, it became a joy to pray. And I began to understand what it meant to pray without ceasing. I began to understand what it was to wait on God and I got an appetite for his word. And like Jeremiah he said, I found thy word and I did eat it. And I discovered that this thing came, and I'm conscious of time, but give me a few moments more, because at that time there was something, I'm looking, I didn't grasp it then, but boy, I grasp it now, in the days in which we're in. I got this tremendous burden, I didn't know what a burden was, but it was a burden from the Lord, and I used to go, go away in, 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 in the farm, there was an old porta cabin down in the farm, and I used to go down there and wait before the Lord, and what always would happen, it happened so regular, is that I would get this tremendous burden for Ireland and the rest of the UK, all, all, of, all of the United Kingdom and Ireland. This would kind of come before me. And I would see all the people and see them perishing. I can't describe it any more than that. I would see them perishing and I would, I would begin to weep. And I would almost go into convulsions and I knew that it wasn't me. I knew it wasn't, certainly wasn't religion and it wasn't church life. I knew it was something divine. It was something because Jesus had got a hold of me. And what I discovered after time was that simply all was happening was that Jesus' pain over the country was being compressed into my heart. And I was simply interceding for them. And although from a distance I would have looked as though I was in pain and agony, and I was, and I was weeping and contorted, yet there was a joy in me that I've never experienced in any other department of my life as a Christian. And God birthed in me this amazing desire and longing for revival, for revival. And while at times that has ebbed and waned through trials and difficulties, that remains alive in my heart. And I want to declare tonight, not only to you, but into the heavens tonight, that there is coming a great revival to Ireland. There's coming a great move of the Holy Spirit to the country of Ireland, and multitudes are going to be saved. Roman Catholics, drug addicts, homosexuals, the people of God don't need to despair. You don't need to be crying and running about the bad of the country. You need to get in touch with God, and God will reveal to you that he's lining this country up for something wonderful, and he's going to move in great power, but it's not going to be the way it was in the past. It's not going to be the way that the evangelicals believe it's going to be. God is tired of being in a box. He's tired of being constrained by men's opinion of doctrine. He's tired and wearied of how Christians, ministers, pastors restrict him and say that he doesn't do this and he can't do that. And that all died with the apostles. God's tired of that. And he's going to demonstrate his power. And there are many fine Christians and pastors and preachers. And they're going to reject and come against what God is going to do. That's tragic, but it's going to happen. 
My friends, I can't make the wind of God blow, but I can set my seal for that wind to blow so that when it does, I'll go with it. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want my little prejudices, my little funny ideas to say to God, I don't believe you can do it, and I, no. I got this tremendous burden. I worked with a number of years with Burley and Pat here in the early days of the work, and then I felt the call of God to faith mission. Went to faith mission for a year, and then my health took bad. I come home. And when I come home with broken health, really, I suppose nobody knew what to make of me. I hardly knew what to make of myself, to be honest with you. And I used to go home and sit with deep depression, wondering, God, what was all that about? Why did you let that happen? And my health's falling to bits, and there's certainly no openings for ministry for me. And it was all a pretty dark period. And I said, Lord, I understand why people wouldn't understand, for I don't, but but Lord, I want you to do something for me at this time because I'm really shaking. I would love you to look after me. I'm just asking you, Lord, in this dark, shaky, difficult period, would you just provide for me? And Lord, if you provide for me, I'll know that you have something for me. Would you do that? And that was way back in 1988, I beg your pardon, 1988 and 1989. And I can say to the glory of God tonight and to testify to him that from 1989 to this present day, I have never had an income, never had a salary. Nobody knows anything about me other than my wife and God. And yet without fail for all those 30 years, God has never failed us. Our income, our car, our house, every provision has come. You say, Alan, that's wonderful. Well, you see, it's just simply what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me give you one illustration before I close. A number of years ago, whenever we had got married, I met my wife. She was from Scotland, and we have three children. But whenever we got married, we went to live in Lisbon. We got a little house and we're renting it. And God guided us to consider buying a house, which was really ridiculous. I have a brother, an accountant, and I remember he looked at my books and he said, Alan, I really don't think you should go down this route. He said, I've been looking at your books for a few years. And so out of a joke, we went into different building societies. We said, we're thinking about buying a house. And they said, oh, very good. And they open, I'm sure you open their big files and... Oh, yes, yes, and what's your name, and all your details, and then, and what do you do? What's your career? Well, we trust the Lord, and, you know, the Lord provides, and, oh, right, thank you, okay, nice to see you, okay, there's another nut case, bye-bye. But without boring you with details, a door opened, God opened a door. And we had to make the decision about buying a house, and we had no guarantee of anything. With, three, with two children at that stage to look after. No guarantee of anything. And boy, did we pray. <laughs> and, and a wee bit of fasting, although I don't think the fasting was more to do with nerves in the stomach than it was to do any big spiritual exercise. But nevertheless, we prayed and fasted. And we prayed and I said, Lord, please, we're, we're, we're making a move toward this. But if this is not right, Lord, please stop us. And you know, that's the way we prayed. If it's not right, stop us because God can. Always give God the right. Give God the choice. Let him in on it. Don't make the decision. You'll regret it. Give God the choice. And we moved in with God and moved, moved. And the day came whenever we had to sign the document and I went in to see the solicitor. And I remember signing it and it was like just buying a bag of oranges. It never cost me a thought. And I come out and he said to me, give me a bill going out. He says, you can send that in and whatever it was. And I thought, oh, that's going to be fun. I, I couldn't cover half of that at the minute. Never mind. And that's, that's just paying the solicitor. Never mind buying the house. So I had a few errands that day, and three in fact. And I went up to a house to visit a man, and there was a man parked at the door. He came out to me. He said, Alan, I haven't seen you for a long time. I said, that's right. Yes, I'm just visiting this person. He came out. He said, I, I, God spoke to me. He says, I have a thing for you. And he came out, and he gave me a check. 
I drove on over to uh, a meeting in Antrim in the evening, went there. And when I went, arrived at Antrim, there was a person who came into a meeting. You never have heard of this before, but there was a meeting, and there was only about 12. I had traveled the whole way from Lisbon to Antrim. And I arrived, and there was 12. And this wee woman came in, and I said, oh, thank God, there's 13. And whenever she came in, she came over to me, and she says, you, Alan, yes, yes, yes. She says, I'm sorry, but I'm having to go home. And I thought, well, that's good. We're back to 12 again. So the numbers are going down. And she says, no, I'm sorry, but God told me to come and see you. I didn't know her from Adam. I wouldn't know her today. She could be in the congregation. But she says, I was praying this morning and God spoke to me and God said, you go to that man. He's in that place tonight and you go and you give him this. And she said, here it is. And I had one more encounter that day regarding finance. And whenever I got home, my wife hadn't seen me all day. And we had a tiny little house and a little, a little uh, table, a little mahogany table in the middle, a coffee table. And she said to me when I went in, well, did you sign it? And I said, I did. And I opened the envelope and I opened the check and I set them and spread it out on the table. And there was approximately a thousand pounds, which is quite a bit, 25 years ago. And my wife said to me, she said, that's the Lord's covenant. I said, it is. He'll not fail us. And he never did. And he never will. And I can tell you, my friends, on the earthly, I could tell you story after story. I have a beautiful home. And I could write a book about it, about how God gave it to us. It's beautiful. And how God, when I look at it, I tell people, I never see a nice house. When I look at it, I see God. I see how he did it. I see how he provided. I see how he moved things. I just see God. And I've talked about those earthly things, and they're okay. But listen, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. You say, well, Alan, okay, you've got your house, and God's providing. What's ahead? What's ahead? Revival's ahead. Revival's ahead. There's going to be a great ingathering of multitudes of souls. And God promised me many, many years ago that I would have the privilege of bringing multitudes into the kingdom. And I believe that. I believe that. And I'm looking forward to getting to heaven. I'm looking forward to meeting my parents. I'm looking forward to meeting loved ones that I left behind at the grave and cried when they were gone, the ones that influenced me to the gospel, the ones that taught me the word of God. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. You know, I could have gone to hell. I could be in the belly of hell tonight, in that place where the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. But God had mercy on me. And God saved me. I want to tell you now, God loves you just as you are. <laughs> you say, Alan, oh, you don't know what I'm like. I don't need to know what you're like. I just know you're a sinner. But I know that Jesus can save you. And I know that Jesus can heal you. And I know Jesus can restore you and break that addiction in your life. I want to tell you that God can change everything and he can make heaven your home and he can make earth a heaven and he can make the home that's a hell, he can turn it to a heaven. He can do all that. <laughs> you have to come to him. Now we're closed. It's over. I'm going to make two simple appeals because I really sense God speaking tonight, and I'm aware of the prayers of God's people, and that's the only reason why I sense the help of God, because there's been praying going on here. And you can always tell. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna speak first of all, for a moment, to believers, those who know the Lord. This is between you and God, I'm out of the picture, but I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you would like tonight to say, Lord Jesus, I've held things back, and I'm not really in any fast lane for God, and I don't even know what I'm meant to do, and I don't know what the future is, and I've made a bit of a mess of the whole thing, but Lord, I'm coming back. I'm coming the best way I can, and I'm, I'm going to give my life to you, Lord, tonight. 
going to give you my future, my ambitions, my dreams. I'm going I'm to let go and I'm going to let God have control. And whatever sin there is, I'll deal with it. And whatever you show me, I'll deal with it. But Lord, I want you. And I, wa- I want you to revive me. I want you to bring your life into me. Lord, that's what I want. And whatever it costs on the journey, Lord, by your grace, I'll do it. If that's the cry of your heart, I want you just to stand where you are and then we're going to pray for you. If that's your heart, between you and God, I'm just going to be silent for a little time and I leave that between you and God. a wonderful opportunity to obey God. Heaven's watching. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who have responded both outwardly and perhaps some in their heart are wrestling. Give grace. Lord, by your Spirit, break down all the strongholds of the enemy. Break down every demonic, every soulish and every fleshly thing. Bring people into wonderful freedom. Hear their cry. Meet them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Finally, if you're in this gathering tonight, every eye closed, you say, Alan, I'm not a Christian, but I'd love to come to Jesus Christ tonight. Love to receive him as my savior. Love to come. He'll receive you. I want you to do something. I'd like you just to raise your hand and say, I'd love to come to Jesus Christ tonight. I'd love to come to him. If you'd like to do that, I'm inviting you. It won't save you. But if in your heart you say, I'd love to come to Jesus tonight, I want you to raise your hand up. And I'll see your hand. I can see your hand. I can see you. Now, I want you to follow me in a prayer. If you've raised your hand, I want you to follow me in this little prayer. And maybe like me, you didn't have the courage. <laughs> maybe you didn't. But I want you to follow me in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. I have broken your laws, and I'm guilty. I repent. Turn from my sin. I open my heart to you. Come in, Lord Jesus. Save me now. And help me to tell what you have done for me. Thank you for hearing me. Let me tell others of your great love. In Jesus' name, amen.